Okay, so welcome everybody here to the Martin E. Siegel um, Theater Center at the Graduate Center CUNY. My name is Frank Hensch, and I'm the director of the center. It's a very special day for us uh, today because we um, are celebrating the history of New York City's theater and performance. And um, we are a university, so of course, uh, uh, academia, um, it focuses very often on the history, on the big names, uh, the supposedly big names, on the big theaters. Uh, luckily, we don't focus on Broadway, which many others do. Our, it's closer to heart, is a La Mama, is a St. Dance, is the BAM, the history of these theaters, but also, of course, of the old uh, PS 122 and uh, coming to the real innovative spaces, spaces where ideas are born, where people could create, where people fought their energy, where people were dancing, when there was part of the use of emerging. These are the places that um, um, we think are of real importance and they actually make a city. I'm German, I'm from Berlin, so the big thing about the city of Berlin were the clubs, the Berghain and the others, the Fisch Labor in the late 70s, early 80s, where we went, 10 people would come or 20, but they were important people who then created the, the rape scene and uh, the laugh parade and so many, many other things. And in New York City, we have two legendary clubs, and there might also others, but two of them are uh, a part of a legend. And one, of course, is Club 57 and then the Pyramid Club. And today we are honoring these places. And a good reason for us also to do this is we feel it's what's missing. The ideas, the energy, the experiments, the setting, uh, innovations that didn't come out of a drama school, innovations that didn't uh, come out of uh, grants uh, from uh, uh, NISCA, then you do something or not. No, it was um, something that uh, uh, evolved. It grew like plants on a very special field. Alexander von Humboldt, the great German uh, um, explorer, all of say, how come, you know, that some plants grow somewhere here and there, but not there. And he found plants in the Himalayas are closer to the one in the Andes. It's about the height where they grow out of the earth. Uh, there's no water, but some come, some others, and there is an extreme beauty from their connections to that. And we feel, of course, a very uh, strong connection. It's a history that also needs to be recorded, archived, and universities and academia the bridge between international theater, global theater, American theater, and professional theater. This is uh, something where we feel very strongly about. This is an archive tonight. We welcome our audiences on HowlRound, um, which is a national nonprofit live stream uh, platform. And uh, we now have a little bit less people in the audience because so many people watch our things online. We did over 200 talks in the time of Corona. So people often go back to them, it will be archived. So this is still an important uh, um, a moment to be with you here in person. We strongly believe uh, in liveness and uh, being with our bodies in spaces, but also, of course, we would like to welcome all our viewers and also we have viewers from around the world. We just finished our film festival. We had over 35 films from 22 nations, um, was watched by also over 40, 50 countries. And this was work from theater artists who create work for the screen. It's still online for the next two and a half weeks. We showed for three or four days films we couldn't show all the time, but it's also something to look at. So after my very, very long uh, talk, which shows the excitement, the seriousness for this event, um, and I would like to uh, thank Tomek, uh, my colleague and also friend, Tomek Smolaski from the Polish Cultural Institute who said, Frank, we really have to do an event about this. It's such a legendary uh, performance place. I have heard about it, everybody have heard about it. There is a book um, and then also coming out on the Pyramid Club, John Jesserin was the one who said, Frank, you know, you should really do something. This is uh, a place where he grew up, John is over there. Actually, I once visited it too. And, um, and then w those two ideas came in the same week, strangely enough, and then he said, why don't we do a day dedicated to uh, New York and New York City and the spirit and the energy and all that that changed, we do think, performance art. So uh, it's a great, great day. And we start chronologically then today, of course, with Club uh, 57. So thank you all for coming. If you have a cell phone, please do take it out. I'll do the same. It should be, what does it say? Silent mode on. Okay. Yeah, just take a moment, really. Please have a look. It never rings in our events. It's really true. And again, really, thank you all for taking the time to be with us. We need 
great theater, great performances, but it will also need great audiences and people who care. And ultimately, this is for the viewers, for the audience. So it's really a big honor to have you all with us. We know how busy you are, how busy New York is, and how beautiful the days are. So here we go. So I'm going to hand you the mics. Thank you. And we have to speak into it because our viewers also online okay. will only hear us when we speak. So um, first of all, um, welcome. And I think a big round of applause for our panelists. Right. So why don't we do it the old fashioned way? We start with you, we go along and you introduce yourself, say where you come from, who you are, okay. and how are you Hi. connected to the people? I am uh, Dani Johnson. I was uh, kind of the house DJ at Club 57. I also DJed at the Pyramid for years. And uh, I came to Club 57 from uh, seeing a flyer at Manic Panic, the punk boutique on St. Mark's Place. Yeah, Stanley. My name is Stanley. Uh, close, so you have to. to. Here, I'm you have to. My, my name in English. <laughs> you you have to hold close. Shopkey. I'm going to hold it for you. Yeah. Polish name is Strychatsky. In English, Strychatsky. <laughs> anyway, I was the founder of the Club 57 in 1978. And today, we have the rest of Club 57. One, two, three, four. Fantastic. So let's go to the next. Everybody. Everybody just got older, married, have a problem, children, and they're very busy to come here. So not thousand people, just three of us. Good. Hi, I'm Andy Weiland, and um, I started going to Club 57, I guess, in 1979. I went to the, um, the Irving Plaza for the... Um, the um, New Wave Vaudeville. The New Wave Vaudeville. New Wave Vaudeville Before show. I knew anybody. Um, and and then I moved to the East Village and then I started to go to Club 57. And I was one of the photographers in April also at Club 57 and the Pyramid both. And I put this book together, which is Club 57 and the Pyramid both. So that's me. <laughs> Hi, I'm April Palmieri. And I started to go to the Monster Movie Club at Club 57. And it was the opportunity to watch a kind of nostalgic, funny 60s horror movies that were like all the special effects were incredibly fake. And it was totally expected for you to make comments while the film was running and to, you know, participate, even though you're in the audience and there's a movie going on, you would just like laugh and make comments about the costumes or the yeah, situations, like if it was realistic or not. So it kind of gave me a lot of bad manners in movie theaters, you know? <laughs> Good images and bad manners. But before we come to the uh -huh. details, um, let's go back um, for a moment in time. Um, what was the very beginning? How did you have the idea? When did you have the idea? Why did you have the idea? How did you find the space? The place was given me by the priest of the Polish National Church. You were a member of the church? No, I'm Catholic. They are Polish national Catholic, so different. Okay. <laughs> so how come? Tell us, you came from Poland. How old were you? Um, why did you come to New York? Don't ask me how old I am. No, Everybody I will not know. No. Ask me after the show. After the show. What? So where, around what time uh, did you come to Poland? Uh, to to the New York. I'm, I came here in 1972, because the another Polish church, Methodist church. My my aunt, she knows the, the 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 priest from the Methodist Church. He helped me to find job when I came here, and he find he went with me to get social security. You know, and he you going with priest, they give you everything. Okay, so, so you were in Warsaw. Where were you, where were you based in Poland? Why did you want to come to New York? Where were you based in Poland? I was living in Gdańsk. Beautiful went to school in Gdansk. 
the architecture style of Netherlands, okay? Anyways, in communist country, everybody dreams about, about America, okay, about freedom. So I was dreaming about America too, because my family came to New York 100 years ago, and I have some here cousins, and my father asked my aunt, her his sister, to, to welcome me to the United States. So she did it. So and nobody knows in Poland I will stay here forever. Only I know. You do. Even not my family. So you listen to American music, films, or books, or poetry. What did you put? In Poland, even even it was communist country, there was many things from America. So I was listening history from French, from radio. So America was my dream. And in Poland, from the beginning, from the from the public school, I always was involved in the art, dancing, showing on the stage. Then I play in the the Catholic uh, theater uh, uh, under the Bishop Kazim in Cluj, and I was already the the Joseph the Joseph the the Holy the Family Paul, the, the same style, but written by Polish writers. So I wrote the book here. I wrote the three books about the young age. I will, I wrote this small book. <laughs> and then I wrote the book about my family. This in Polish language. And then I wrote the book about life as art. The Clappy Demonstrator. You can buy for ten dollars on the internet, okay, if you wish so. So did you study art in mm -hmm. Poland? Did you yeah, to, I, what did you study? I didn't study. I was was belonged to some group of the artists. Of painting okay. or dance or performance. What did you yeah, do? Yeah, I belong also to the uh, theater. Mm -hmm. You were in theater? Yes. So when I came here, the the churches mostly they don't have many members. It's not Catholic. Methodist, National Polish, there are few members, they have not enough money to run the church, but they have hold downs there. So, because they, they, after the interview with me, they know I can do something here. So, in the Methodist church in, in Greenpoint, I opened the, the club, we call, um, Renaissance Club, okay? And we, we did several shows for the blind kids in Poland, in Latsky. So, because for that show, the bishop from Polish National Church came here to see the show. And he saw me, I was able to do something. So, when I finished with Methodist Church after a while, because I have another job. He got my phone and he called me if I can do in his church in Manhattan. So I went to him and after meeting with my mother and with friends, I decided to get the, the hall downstairs and created some performance, dancing party for Polish people also, I'm another project. I didn't know what I was going to do. <laughs> I put on the door East Village Student Club. That was the first sneaky name, okay? So every student from NYU and no, not only came here and they, they wanted to know what's going on because not so many clubs uh, in, at that time. So. I do some uh, some uh, some performance from some producers. It's here in the book, 
and then four bench punk came here and they said you wanted to do show you wanted to play music in your club they they came here everybody was coming here to me i'm not wasn't wasn't come so the the bishop asked you come and run a club run something in no, a so center me, sir. i said there is not enough money to to do always the dancing party for polish people because it's is now his village less polish people than before so can i change the club for american club he say okay so the four bands come here and i show you the name of the 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 chapter in my book the punks are coming so it was a polish club from a church yes. for dancing traditional polish Folk dancing. I did it, yes. Your experience was also theater in Poland, like yes. theater in cha in the churches, in context of a, yeah, yeah. a sacred spaces. But then I keep the dancing Saturday for Polish people, and I open there another days for English people, okay, English speaking for Americans. So the four bands came here because the information about club went around this village. So the name of the the flesh tones, right? Yeah. The flesh tones was the first band, I believe. Sorry, I, I lost myself. Oh, the tears, the name of the band, the communists, the blessed, and the New York niggers. Strange punks names. So first, the the men from Polish. Communist club came. From, they have a club like this. They say, "Why you put the communists here? They, they very aggressive. You not, you're not supposed to do the show." He tried to teach me that I am wrong. Then, the, because I was <coughs> my friend, black man teacher, he was um, he was teaching English language in the church. He came here, Stanley, what's going on? What kind of club is it? Everywhere, the New York niggers, the New York niggers. And he was black, okay. I said, sorry, this is the name of the band. They put themselves the name. Uh, and the problem was solved. He got the information that was the name. And they were very nice people. All four bands, very nice people, and my best friends for all my life. And they were punks. And so it was a Friday evening, then Saturday was dancing. These were Friday evenings the bands would play? Yes. And they wanted, the, the four punk bands want to play music. <laughs> they don't want anything. I said, I'm here myself. I'll be on the bar. You have to clean the hall. You have to charge at the door. You have to do everything. You have to do advertisement. Okay. So they put all around his village, the, the poster Club 57, and play the four bands. So they actually give the name for the Club 57 from the number of the building. So um, after, after a while, I, when I start to do more um, Mm, program for for young uh, uh, people in New York. Many were coming here. I put Club 57 instead of 57 Club. I put Club 57. I say, there is Uptown Studio 54, but I am Club 57. Okay, that was two reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, the name of the building and against Studio 54 because Studio 54 was a club for rich and famous. They have only show for fun and my club was show for friendship, for fun and for art. So, Tell us, what was your idea? What was the vision? What did you want this club to do? What was special about it? My, 
when I hire a manager, I put the calendar, like they preach with the squares, and then say you have to put every day for whole month's program. Yes. Every day in the week? Every day. Because many people will come here, I can do it. So we have play, we have party, we have music, we have uh, painters, exhibitions, many, many things uh, was uh, in, in, the, in the club. So, and everything was written and made on the, on the calendar. And you decided who would come or not? Yes, and I tell it, and Magnusson, who became mm, manager, I tell her to you have to do the calendar because people come here, you have to do them because you don't know what to do next day. And if you have agreement with them and you put the calendar, they will come and they do it. This way, this way, you have a program for whole month. It's a good idea. Okay, and you have to know. You have to. You have to. You have to be alone. You have to clean. You have to sell the tickets, you have to do, and you have to ask them to do it. Good. Because this is not for the money, okay? Yeah. So how much did it cost to come to a concert, to do a uh, play? The flash drones charge $1 or $2. <laughs> One dollar. So that's did you ever make money? I want, I want to tell you, they told me, we don't need money, we just want to play with you. Okay? And they were... They were very nice. They would put beer on the head. They throw the bottle on the floor. They rip the the clothing off, of like funky style, okay? <laughs> but they were very nice boys anyway. Even if they, if they, let's say, behave on the stage, not so nice. Good. So okay. they threw the beer on the floor, but then clean. But that time, so that's they, good. What was the punk style in New York? Okay, you can see many of them on the East Village. Just punks. Yeah. Punks run, run, run the East Village. Mm -hmm. uh, later will change. So maybe we go to um, uh, um, to Danny and Andy in April. Let's for our, how did it feel like when you came the first time in the club? Tell us maybe you what was the, how, paint us a picture. I think the first time that I came uh, probably I think it was for a monster movie club, and seventy uh, two or. Oh, no, no. The the club didn't even start till like the late 70s. So it was probably in 1978 or 9. Um, I came and I met a bunch of people. And I'm still friends with uh, the ones that are still alive. And, uh, you know, it's just as soon as I went there, it was like, well, we had so much fun just talking to everybody, um, you know, yelling at the screen and, and having just the so best tell us time. What street was it on? Did you go in the basement? Or how did you arrive there? How did it look like? Tell us a little bit. Well, it was uh, 57 St. Mark's Place. It was under the church. It was like you know, three steps down. It wasn't like a really deep basement. Uh, when you would walk in, there would be uh, on this side, there was like uh, there was a bathroom. There was a door here that went up to the church. There was a, a little area with a screen like uh, People would sit there with, uh, you know, to collect the one dollar, and um, you know, and then you'd go in, and it was about, it was smaller than this room, um, a lot smaller, and you know, a little little room with a jukebox on one side, a bar on the other side, and uh, and a stage that was about as high as the the lowest riser there, and uh, some chairs and tables, and. Um, it was just funky and, and it was like very homely. It was very fun. How full was it normally? Or? Well, I mean, it, it would feel pretty full with about, I'd say, 50 people. Um, but, you know, there was a lot of events that had maybe 20 people. It really didn't matter because we didn't really have to make money. Um, because <laughs> He got the money from the li from the bar, I think. Uh, sometimes I would bartend, and you know, I mean, we, because it was a church, you know, it wasn't like you know there were no liquor laws. We just buy the booze, sell the booze, not pay taxes, that kind of thing. Church gave church gave it for free, right? It gave the space for free. Yeah. 
Well, they are uh, history. I think the great Valeska Gerd, the great German expressionist dancer who had to flee Nazi Germany, she opened a bar. One people say one of the first performers for the Beggars Bar. It's also a legendary place. I think her um, waiters were uh, John Cage, Robert Rauschenberg. Uh, Judas Molina, Julian Back, people came. It was very unknown. They were known at the time, but it also attracted people. And she had performances also um, going on. And for a time, it was extremely hard. I read the book about it, um, how much she fought against mafia police. Uh, and also, it was forbidden to drink and dance and all of it. So it's a, it's a great history. Tell us a little bit, maybe come to you. What was your impression? When was the first time you went in? What do you remember? Um. Well, I, 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 w I had just moved to New York, and I was living in the West Village at the time, and I went to the New Wave Vaudeville, which was actually... The new? Uh, Second? It's called New Wave Vaudeville, and it included many of the core people from Club 57, but I didn't know them, and I just went to this show. But it turns out, after the fact, that that particular show was sort of like the headliner of the Club 57 crowd, in a way. It just Tell us a bit, the, who were the well, people from Club 57? Who were the... Well, you know, everybody, I think everyone had their own circle. So I feel like our circle was like the circle. But as time went on, you realize that there were many different circles that went to Club 57. But, um, you know, I was part of the, I guess, the Pulse Lama circle. Um, I was taking photos of a lot of the same people. Like, you know, we would do uh, uh, events in other places, too, outside of Club 57. Like with Ann Magnuson, you know, we would, we had the, um, so, you know, just we did a lot of different events. And not just at Club 57, it was kind of sprang out of that. But we had fashion shows at Club 57, art shows. So there were many people involved, even though our circle maybe was 20 people that I was close friends with, which we still are. But there were also so many other people involved in it that I never maybe became close to. But um, I found it because there were some flyers around town. But also, um, when I moved to the East Village, I had um, some friend neighbors who were going, and then I started going with them. So that was kind of how I, how I ended up there, which I would have anyways probably, but, but anyways, so. Um, Rachel? Uh, yes, we're looking at Andy's photos here, but I have some photos also, and I show the front of the club. And, you know, uh, not everything's in order, just like my memories. It's like I can't recall everything in a linear fashion, but, um, yeah, the first time I went, I told you it was Monster Movie Club, but I also went, had gone to the New Wave Vaudeville show, and I was very impressed. And I couldn't talk any of my friends into going. I went twice by myself, but I had a great time. I think it's and I do remember uh, especially David McDermott and Klaus Nomi were probably the standouts of the entertainers at that point. And at Club 57, I, I kind of got invited to be in the Ladies Auxiliary, which spawned a couple of bands like Pulse mm -hmm. and events. And yeah, we, it, it actually was popular. One day I was walking down the street the day after a show and some guys were singing one of our songs. <laughs> I didn't tell him it was I was involved, but I was really impressed. <laughs> we had done a show with Danceteria. But that was really fun. Some of our things were actually formed enough that they could go to other clubs in other cities. So I also performed with John Sexton, the Bodacious Tatas, and we went to Florida several times, Miami, Fort Lauderdale, and uh, Key West, and also to San Francisco, and Vancouver, and Seattle, and Japan, and uh, Boston, I think we played, uh, and Philly, and Washington, D.C. So, you know, these little nuggets turned into things that went on, and then the club kind of petered out around 1983, but I kind of didn't notice because I was still hanging out with the same core friends. Like you said, you have like 20 good friends, and if they need you, you just show up and you do something. As a matter of fact, tomorrow Michael Musto is going to do a video at Stone in front of Stonewall. Uh, he's making a gay pride video if anybody wants to do it. But it's kind of like, let's put on a show. And I met him through the Club 57 people because we did plays also with Scott Whitman and Mark Shaman, you know, who went on to Broadway and were very, very successful. They're probably the most successful people who survived, <laughs> shall we say, from that period. Uh, did I want to say something about that? Well, uh, Mark Shaman and Scott Whitman did a show called uh, Living Dolls way, way before any Barbie movie. 
and I was, <laughs> and I thought when I I I saw every performance of it, and I would work at the bar that to see it. It was so good, and uh, they tried to bring it somewhere else, and of course Mattel went after them, and then I think they tried to change the names, and you know if it's not going to be Mattel's dolls. You know what's the point of it? So it didn't it didn't work out, but uh, things have certainly worked out for them. I mean, I think in the recent New Yorker article, it talked about Keith Haring and uh, Basquiat being at the at the Flipper, or whatever. Say, you know, being in the basement. How how was that a mixture then of artists? Who was it? Like people were hanging out, or was it always programming where you came to the event, or was it just a meeting point? Both. It was both. I mean, people were hanging out all the time, drinking. What time did it start then? Yeah, uh, seven, eight. We'd just wander over there. Yeah. And when did it I close? Um, whatever time, right? Close. Close when when people left. Yeah. I mean, it could it I could mean, be late. Yeah. I mean, some shows were more formal. Like, I mean, like the plays were more formal. I mean, they had to have chairs out, and you know, it had beginning and end. And some things were just a variety show, and some things were a slideshow. So it, it was just, or a movie. It was just all various. And things. who had the key to o close it? I don't know. <laughs> who had the key, Stanley? Was it ever closed? Who, who opened, who, <laughs> Stanley, who, who, how did it close down? Who had the who key the in the door? evenings? How did that work? Probably Ann. Yeah. You know, I have a class with the seven, but I have always worked. I work like superintendent of the 50, actually. <laughs> I was superintendent of the 57 Street, Saturn Place. I was super over there. <laughs> and every day I have to come here. Sometimes I was so tired, I was sleeping on the floor of the class because I wanted to come back. Did you lock the to, door? To my apartment or to my Did room. you lock no. the door at the end of the night? or who Wh locked the Whoever door? had the, the night, whoever was taking care of that night <laughs> would have the key and would lock the gate. So I was sleeping with the mouse because the mouse was still over there. <laughs> Stanley, tell us about some of your great memory, the moments you remember. What do you remember most from the club? Moments, evenings. I so the uh, great moment was when the. Three painters started to have a relationship with Andrew Warhol, and they were uh, going to to him to downtown to see his gallery, and they make relationship, personal relationship with Andrew Warhol. Oh, he's he's hugging Andrew Warhol. <laughs> Keith Haring. And okay. Warhol. So, so he was one of the painters. Yeah. Then we were Ann Magnuson. She was the manager, great manager, and she created special relationship with the old people. They became like old family friends. That's the that's the special point. How the club became great because there was CBGBs, mm -hmm. Marcus Carter's, because they just they took the band, played the music, sell the beer, and goodbye. Here was a family club, okay? Family club from all the East Village people. Yeah. So, and the and did uh, Pulsolama band. That was great moment. So they were so loud and noisy that the Japanese people called them to Japan, and they went to do show over there in Japan. That was maybe a great moment, because there were many great moments, like uh, the, the many, the, the the, the, sh the Broadway show, what is the name? You're thinking of uh, Mark Shaman and Scott Whitman? This is a picture of the outdoor gate, oh, yeah. and you can see the person collecting money on the inside. Yeah. This is what you would see as you arrived. 
good answer. Put your ash in the corner. It's a mic ash. They, they, they did show force and clap to be seven. Then, after they finish, they go on the Broadway with the, with the, with their big show, the hair. Okay. Yeah. Incredible. Um, he started Club 57. That was a great moment because they were very, very friendly. Okay. Right. Um, one, one of their big stars was Holly Woodlawn. Mm -hmm. They that uh, Mark Shane and said they would they would do um, what was their their famous show with Holly Woodlawn? It was and um, they they did a, their own version of the Sound of Music. They did their own, yeah with Holly Woodlawn. Music. Right. Was she Maria? Yes, she's yeah, great. She uh, was Maria. Maria yeah. Von Trapp. Just, just to name drop somebody. Mostly we talk about Club 57 oh, at 57 Saruman's place. But because I have so many bands who want to do the show, so I rent Irving Plaza Hall, and I did separately bigger show at Irving Plaza uh, for the rock bands. So that was a great moment for me. Okay. For you coming from Poland, that idea of uh, sacred spaces in a way, the idea of community, is it met, was it something you brought from Europe? Did you feel it was a Polish uh, spirit you brought? Or was it a New York spirit that had nothing to do where you came from? You know, it's, that's, that's mostly what's created in New York, not not not. Not, not, not exactly Polish because Club Fifty Seven wasn't too much involved in Polish life. Okay, it was strictly New York, New York life. Okay, for New York youth students and New York society, and and I was here myself with my mother. We don't have too much family and friends, so we created. My mother and me, we created relationship with with these people, and I like to hug everybody, smile. So they like to come here, like because many of them they were long, they were long, also with our family. So they were coming here to look for the friendship and the and like for family club. Okay, that's the. The, the 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 spirit of the club fifty seven. No money because <laughs> never never were enough money to to pay for the church or to to pay people who work over there. Okay, so. Well, I just like to say that I think uh, one of the things that made it different and made it so successful long term was because it wasn't about making money. There wasn't um, a liquor license. There wasn't really an owner of the place. So it was a, a t totally creative free-for-all. And I think if it wasn't for that, I don't think that we'd probably be here today. Mm -hmm. If it was a regular establishment, regular rent, regular owner, regular bar, somebody watching us, I don't think it ever would have happened. I think it's because Stanley had that space and it was because it was in a church that we could get away with it. Otherwise, I don't think we could. So, so it was truly a free space, an open space, and totally. in a way of the American dream, which is such a bad connotation. But it was a where people could come from anywhere, whether it was Europe or from any small place. If they had ideas, if they connected, they had a home. There was a place right. to dream and to present and to share. True. I mean, it did have a, uh, you know, there were cer a certain things that maybe would not have fit in. I mean, it was pretty open, but I mean, within this circle of people, mm -hmm. it usually stayed within this downtown, like you said, student East Village theme. That was mostly mostly what we had. If you uh, look, I think the NYU created a new building for the theater students. I don't know if you saw that to create, looks like Scarlett Johansson in a sci-fi movie. Um, I think NY, not, I think also Columbia University made a gigantic big theater and students don't even want to go there. They want to be in small, Spaces, so I think it's something to to really think about. Where does creativity start? Where is it fostered? Small spaces, so, someone who takes care, as kind of a mother, a father, a, 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 ongoing relations over, as you say, decades. So this is something I think we 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 are terribly missing in New York. So much money is being spent on the art. The shed is mm -hmm. seven hundred fifty million 
Perlman, 650 million. Or where did something happen? Were spaces, they, they, they cost no money, they were open. How can that be that we don't have that? You know, money. Uh, we're missing. Money, it's all about money. Yeah, but it's also something, yeah, for thinking um, um, or the mind. But maybe we have so many people in the audience here who were there, who were friends. Maybe I can also go around and you can tell your memories or make a comment. Is that, should we, should we do that? Will we record it also? Is there anybody who wants to um, say something or contribute a memory, a comment? Yeah. Please introduce yourself uh, so we hear it. Yeah, Kastutis Nakas, and I, I used to go to Club 57, and I, but I, I don't think I was an insider there, but I one night, because I, I went there a lot, but there was this one night, and there was this guy, you know, we all knew his name by then, it was Keith Herring, but it wasn't, he wasn't famous yet, but it, I went in there, and there was this, a bunch of those radiant babies that he had just invented. It was a brand new image, the little baby image, you know, with the rays around him. And there were a couple of them in that vestibule outside the restroom. And, and it, there he was inside the restroom painting more. And he had the, the whole inside of the restroom was covered with those things. And I thought, oh my God, this is amazing. And then he started he started drawing them out the hall and up the stairs and all the way down, heading east on St. Mark's. And it was like you went down St. Mark's the next day and there were all these radiant babies all the way down the street. And I thought then later it occurred to me, well, this is the moment when that explosion of art that really Club 57 began uh, headed east to the forbidden zone of, of Avenue A and beyond, and that which led to all the, the pyramids and things like that. But anyway, thank you for being here and talking. It's a great memories and, and uh, that's what I got. And not only the streets of New York, it became so known around the world and represented the city. Um, my name is Yolanda Hawkins and I knew April from our SVA friends and um, I remember going to see Pulse Lama, and it was like, I used to say it's like 20 women who can't play their instruments, and it was like so great. And, and we would always sing the songs after it because it was so funny. And the three of us did a show there um, on a religious, in the program of New Religious. New, new Religious Directions for 1982. And it involved uh, all different acts, and we, we did the further adventures of Joan of Arc. Scene one. <laughs> and and uh, the saints were aliens from outer space that were studying Joan of Arc because she was talking to herself in the woods. And I was Joan of Arc, and, and I, even then I was like 20, and so I had a line saying, one of them say, well, if she's 13, I'm 13. <laughs> and John was St. Michael. John was St. Michael. I just remembered, so what, did I have a... Uh, tissue box on my yeah. head. We had no budget uh, I was very costumes. heavily costumed. Uh, we had no budget costumes, so I made, uh, I painted a Kleenex box and made a very, you know, medieval hat out of it and things like, uh, half the people in the cast were wearing my clothes. <laughs> and uh, John, where is John Joe's room? Okay. <laughs> uh, didn't we do Nunchang pieces there? Yeah, we did. Mm -hmm. Oh, that was there too. I didn't. Yeah. <laughs> and I filled in for John at St. Mark's. Oh. And I filled in for John at St. Mark's Church when he couldn't do it one or two nights. <laughs> so I had to do my tippy head ring number. <laughs> so anyway, it was just a great vibe to be there. And I'm for me, I'm really happy to hear the history because even though I went there, I didn't really understand how it started and what a labor of love it was. And it really did have, and the shows there, you just came in and you just felt at home. You know, it wasn't a competitive uh, vibe. And I think that spilled over into places like the pyramid. Yeah. Anyone else? A comment or? Audit? No, so. Well, I, I can comment that yes. we had a lot of, uh, one night only art shows. 
Sometimes they were uh, group shows. Sometimes they were individual shows like uh, Keith Haring. Some, uh, even uh, Jean-Michel Basquiat, I think, did his very first uh, solo show there. And um, the stuff he showed was really nothing like what you see and you know the style evolved from there. Um, he did go there. He didn't go there all the time. Um, he was more of someone you would see at Tier 3 or the Mud Club. But, you know, he was around all the time, and he was on St. Mark's, and uh, he was on Astor Place selling his postcards. And, uh, you know, and he was definitely a big part of the East Village early scene. Before there was a fun gallery, there was Club 57. And um, people like Keith Herring brought south bronx artists down so that we had uh we had people like fab five freddy we had africa bombada dj at, at club 57 and i think we were probably the first downtown club to uh to bring those artists down and and uh you know have them you know present to a completely different audience i mean a lot of us most of us were uh you know exiles from suburbia and not not born and raised you know in the lower east side and uh, how what was dance uh, was, was also a dance community presenting or um you mean like like dance troops or dance troops dancers um, well, shows like Sean, Sean, yeah, yeah we had some in-house dance stuff not oh yeah frank holiday had been a trained dancer as well even though he's known as an abstract painter a very a successful show, yeah. painter uh, well we all chipped in and did things and we danced yeah. whether we knew how to or not like one thing we did uh kenny sharp was in a little ensemble that we did and we were all like doing some kind of uh, mystical dancing and he ended up on the wrong side of the stage so to get back to where we were he did a little jeté like it was on purpose here i am <laughs> you didn't notice me right. but sean mcquay sean sean he had a yeah. whole dance company when he started oh. there i That's didn't realize that that's nice yeah, yeah sean right. mcquay uh, who was known as ammo he had a he, a, a he, he kind of did a, a dance yeah. troupe at, at club 57 we also had people like Yoshiko Chuma and uh, her School of Hard Knocks. They came and did stuff there. I mean, it, they were all over the place. They weren't strictly our club. Dance was not as represented yeah. at the club. It wasn't really the space. It wasn't that big enough for like a whole. You yeah, know. the stage was like impossible. You couldn't really do and much. How, <laughs> and how was with poetry? I know the Living Theater hosted a lot and uh, it was the New York poets were they part of the scene? Oh, definitely. There were there were poets. In fact, um, Keith Haring, before he became known for his uh, for his radiant babies, he did a, a poetry night, and he was really interested in um, Gertrude Stein, and he was interested in like well, he would cut up words and stick them on things and. He would do posters. I mean, he did really funny posters all around the East Village of like, you know, I'm sure you've seen the, the, the dachshund with the wheels in the back and it said humiliation victim and stuff about the Pope. And uh, he had this, he found a book that was really homophobic about like, you know, gay men have big hips and little hands and he, he <laughs> Xeroxed those and stuck them around. He. Mm -hmm. He made a stencil that said clones go home and put that in front of the, the saint when it opened. <laughs> yeah. Probably. Definitely, yes. Can you repeat the question? So oh, the question was, uh, is Club 57 where John Sex started performing? And it, it definitely was. He was a student at School of Visual Arts, and he was really great at uh, silk screening. He did posters for a lot of stuff. He did posters for the events at Irving Plaza. And um, at one point, uh, he decided he was going to be a performer. So before he actually ever performed, he silk screened posters that said, John Sex coming soon, and stuck them all over the place. He did not have an act yet. 
<laughs> but but he was in a rock band in Long Island before he came to the city, and that's how he went. He met Wendy Wilde. Mm. They were a couple, and um, he met her because she came to an audition, and he said something like people were going while she was singing, "What's that noise?" <laughs> but she's really great. If you know Wendy, she was like, you know, very in influenced in uh, blues rock vocals and very successful. She was in so many bands, but uh, that was what John said <laughs> how they met. And there's a photo of them together that's on that website you helped put up for her. And John has his natural <laughs> colored hair, his, a Fu Manchu And his mustache. mustache. Oh, right. He looks 70. like one of the Almond Brothers. And uh, <laughs> she looks like a little, you know, Long Island pixie lady in a little leather coat. And, <laughs> and they're in, sitting amongst the Phragmites in yes. Long Island. It's so Long Island. <laughs> and we're giggling because that's where we're from. <laughs> Yeah. So are any are any of the songs from the band are them any of them recorded or is there any way of hearing them? Um, John Sex has an album, right? Can you there are there it? are yeah. two singles that right. John Sex put out. I don't know if that that band ever their band was probably like a cover band, I don't know, but Wendy Wilde uh you know, you can hear some of her stuff. She was in a lot of bands. She was in a lot of stuff. Das Fur Lines was very popular. It's a great band. I Mad yeah. Violets, psychedelic band. And then Paul Salama but, um, put out the first record, which was The Devil Is My Husband's Body, and then the flip side. But then, but then a whole bunch of us quit, and then the rest of the band continued on for a while, and they put out another record. There was a reissue of uh, The Greatest Hits last year. It, was, it came out recently. I don't know if you actually want, I, I have copies, I haven't played them yet. But. It's, not, it's not the original <laughs> band, though, just so you know that. The original but band. I think it was a little bit of both. Yeah. But we didn't use those songs. Yeah. So. Oh, okay. But anyhow, <laughs> no. But I wanted to talk about Wendy, because Wendy such a talent. And um, she unfortunately died of cancer in uh, 1996. She is heard on, like, the background of, Brons of one of the Bronsky Beat songs. I forget which one. She sang back up for, uh, there was a house music uh, producer who used to come to the pyramid. They would, they would uh, practice and vogue and stuff. She's in the background of house music record. She uh, did, she had how many bands? She had the Mad Violets. She had the Screaming Hyenas. She had the, she had the Das Furlines. She had also she did stuff that was like uh, uh, like it was supposed to be like Joey Heatherton. She did all kinds Joey, Joey Heather, Heather Rock. Rock, which she got from the Flintstones, and uh, she was just a super talent. And she did uh, come from Club Fifty Seven. She was core Club Fifty Seven. Also, she auditioned for a lot of plays. She was involved in so many things. I mean, this was like her life was performing. So she would you know, get a lot of parts. Yeah, I mean, she's like a true performer. She just, that's her. I mean, you know, I mean, some people just in their blood. That was Wendy. And um, she died too young, you know, so she was 40 when she died. But, but it, it raises the question of the archive. Is there the idea, is there an archive? Is there a central, is there a website dedicated? What do, how will put the new generation of students um, who are interested in that, or theater artists, how would they find out? It's a good question. Um, I mean, there's like, you know, people have photos. Um, you know, I mean, I'm just using this as one example, but um, this um, moment is a big show, so it kind of became a more of a national name, I guess, from through MoMA, I would say. Um, but it's a good question. It's a good question. I don't know. You know, there is no no one is collecting it at the moment. No, I mean, there's a lot of collections. Well, I don't know. Stanley has a lot. Stanley, tell us about your uh, tell us about uh, your all collection. All my collection gone to Mama, and they have all they have, they keep everything in archive. Okay. All the things what right. I have stamps, my shirt, right. my <laughs> the Keith Herrings, these right. posters, whatever it was. Uh, uh, Mama wants to keep it, and I gave them. 
Okay. Because I said, what do I have to do? I'm going to die and my family will throw away to the garbage. Oh, no, it's a good place for it. <laughs> but still, it's uh, different to have something in boxes, but to archive it and to, you know, make it so, uh, is there Whatever is, is always mostly on the internet, okay? And there is special, um, special, special 50, 50 columns the mama sent to my apartment special artist, computer artist, who created the archive, flat piece of archive, about 50 pages, or whatever it is. And that's the, that's the, that's the best thing what I have. The, 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 the everything, the things, like for Club 57 is in, in the museum, okay, forever. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> they say, you, what do you want to do it? Say, okay, well, keep it and maybe somebody say, in the museum, since somebody in the future, they want to study Club 57, mm -hmm. they come to museum, pay the money and they will do, they do all the things what the, what the museum has. Mm -hmm. So, so mm -hmm. the, the one thing, great thing, to what I have to tell you, the last year of the club, all the club artists did great show, I mean, what the big club, the nice club, the show for Club 57. What year was it? What, what year? La Danceteria. Danceteria Club. All the artists from Club 57, all, many. They did all day and all night show for Club 57 benefit. And they made a few thousand dollars they gave them. So nice. mm -hmm. they, they, they organized the, the show at Danceteria Club. Yeah. I mean, the club benefit for Club 57. I was a great, great flex uh, moment to show who was the Club 57. Family, friendship, love, okay? Yeah, and Steve Hager did a book very early on called Art After Midnight, which is about Club 57, and it was very early on, um, before it was even, anybody hardly knew about the club. It does, so it there does are want to be there. together all the time. Yeah. Mm. But still, if someone could write a big book, it hasn't been done yet, and um, if anybody's listening, uh, students or whatever, you know, so um, we should, we can hear, and then I'll come back to you. Um, hi, I'm Julie here. Um, do you feel like the book that MoMA put out, which is a catalog, but I would call it more of a book because it's pretty hefty. Yeah. Do you feel like that, when you look at that, do you look at it and feel like that's that's a great representation? Or do you feel like uh, there's a lot of, you know, there's just so much stuff that they missed? No, I didn't read through it. I read the introduction. I read the introduction and I thought it sounded a little scholarly to me. You know, it didn't. Just in terms of what was included. Well, it included a lot of stuff. So yes, it was it was really good. Um, yeah, I mean it was it's pretty good. And Club Fifty Seven gets mentioned in many books. That's the thing. It comes up in so many books, like um, like the new Keith Haring book, the the the, the one that just came out about Keith Haring. Club Fifty Seven's mentioned. Um, the Mud Club book, Club. You know, it's just mentioned. In many, many different publications. Um, not in context where it has um, all the artwork included. No, but I mean, no, it's not. Yeah. yeah. You keep asking. Yeah, you keep <laughs> asking, is there a book? You know, is there a. Is yeah, there a, no, is yeah, there you're a, right. No, no, there's. I'm trying to say, there is this book. Yeah. Um, maybe it's. Yeah, well, I, well I think it's pretty good. There's a yeah. lot of art in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah there's lots of stuff, yeah. I didn't read the whole thing. <laughs> I haven't, I haven't read it either. <laughs> Me too. I'll just look at the pictures. Yeah, the pictures, yeah. Um, and then you, and then you. I just, Kastudis Nakas, very quickly, Frank, you asked about archiving this stuff, and um, I just want to mention that a lot of the stuff, well, there's a Seng Kwong Chi, uh, Keith, I mean, Kenny Scharf, uh, a lot of Ann Magnuson and um, and who else? And Wendy Wild. Uh, th those guys came on my cable show in 1982 a lot. 
So MoMA, when they collected that, all of that is in the archives there. And it, I don't know if it's a really great, it's not a whole cross section of the Club 57 people, but they're the ones I could get to come on my show. And there's some pretty fabulous stuff. I mean, there's a great duet by Wendy with John. There's a thing of Wendy hawking her. She invented a shampoo, strip tease shampoo. It strips, strips and teases your hair at the same time. You know, she was funny too, you know. So um, that's there. And with Kwong Chi, who was another great Club 57 artist who, you know, probably maybe is good to mention. Kai Eric is in that archive. Um, and, um, but, uh, you know, Kwong Chi's show, now that he's touring a lot, and then they play some of that footage from your program of programs. So, you know, whenever anybody asks, can we, can we use some of that? I always say yes, you know, so and let them have it because that's what what it was about. Um, well, that's good because there wasn't that much video then, and that's one of the problems, you know. So that's great that you have those videos because people didn't have video cameras then. It's just like right, right, right. Right, because in those days, yeah. <laughs> no, that's good. <laughs> Uh, my name is Christina. I am a Stanley friend. And telling the truth, I didn't know too much about this club, 57, and I didn't know that he was the pioneer of this club. And it's absolutely a big pleasure to meet you guys. And I'm very much in art and music. And so sorry for me that I didn't know you that time. <laughs> yeah. I moved from Upper West Side maybe 15 years ago to East Village and I really started to enjoy. I know you guys know Anyway Cafe when I was a part of this life. Many artists came, Second Street and Second Avenue. Unfortunately, after 28 years, the club was closed. We were crying, it was very, very sad situation. They survived during a pandemic, it was a small place. Somehow they survived, but it was the building problem and they moved now it's the part of the club at the Pangea Club. It's Second Avenue and Eleven Street. What I recommend it highly. And uh, also, I want to ask: uh, You were open seven days evening, or like uh, certain days, or just the evenings? Uh, just the evening, seven days, right? And there was any limit for alcohol? Age limit for the alcohol, or everybody <laughs> welcome? <laughs> like uh, now. I don't think that was. An but issue. seemed to me very interesting, fun club. But thank you so much for the, for introducing that. What what was your club or the one you were? Uh, you're then I thought this was a Pangea club. A Pangea club. Mm. Oh, uh, yeah. Anyway, mm. but oh, okay. Ah. okay. Hi, my name is Ed Woodham, and thank you so much, each of you, for sharing your stories from that period. I was at Club 57, um, and I had just gotten off the truck from Georgia and found it through a series of different connections, and it had a huge impact on my work today and throughout my time as an artist. Um, always in the background, always shy, but um, the first time I saw Klaus Nomi was at Club 57, which was still an experience that I'll never forget. Uh, John Sex met Keith Haring. Keith Haring um, and I were a handful of white kids with, that would go to Paradise Garage on, um, you know, during that period. I was a, a waiter at Life Cafe and worked at Life Cafe for a while and um, a regular, like my living room at um, Dent's Tyria, um, because uh, the cook, Peter Curry, was one of my best friends, and so I had free entree to Dent's Tyria, drink tickets and food, and um, went on after, and I was from, from Atlanta, so I knew uh, the crew before they came up here of RuPaul and Lady Bunny and Floyd and that whole Atlanta crew that came up. And um, he didn't come to New York though. Um, and then uh, went on back, I left 
after the AIDS crisis, or I thought I was leaving uh, in the, like 1986 to go back to Atlanta and um, have learned so much from Club 57 about taking what you have around you and making something, um, not waiting. And, and so I founded a place there called 800 East that did something very similar, very, very, very inspired by Club 57. And then I'll plug now that I do a program working with uh, Bonnie Stein, who's sitting over here, who also works with uh, Yoshiko Chuma um, School of Hard Knocks, and she works with me as well as the uh, person who sort of leads us. And my program's called Art in Odd Places uh, that's uh, been on 14th Street for the last 20 years, um, so just putting visual and performance in public space. Thank you. I'm Stephen Watson, and um, I think Ann Magnuson is a really key figure uh, at Club 57, and I would be interested in anything you or people in the audience that knew her could say about her. Well, uh, she was, she's the kind of person that um, could, like, consolidate a whole lot of people's ideas and then make them happen. You know, like you could be like, you know, wouldn't it be great if I did whatever? And then suddenly it was happening because she made it happen. So she would get people together at her apartment um, for a little meeting of the Ladies Auxiliary of Lower East Side. And uh, during that time, we would look at the calendar and bounce ideas around about, you know, what are we going to do for programming? And uh, a lot of times, uh, you know, it would just be like, well, one one person said, I want to play, I've got a whole bunch of new reggae records, I want to play them. And uh, someone else said, I want to do a putt-putt golf course. So they put them together, and that was this night called putt-putt reggae, which everyone seems to remember, but there were only about five people there. <laughs> and uh, you know the the golf course was made with garbage that we found on the street, and the uh, we didn't even have golf balls because it's too expensive. So we got some um, they were like little plastic oranges to use as golf balls. It was impossible. <laughs> so you know that so that, I mean this just the kind of thing that you know that was definitely her idea to put the two together. <laughs> Any, April, can you think of anything? Well, um, Anne was very uh, enthusiastic about, yeah, making ideas happen and including everybody into making her programs go. And like she started the Ladies Auxiliary of Lower East Side, so that was a way for all the ladies to get together. And um, we, the first meeting I remember was at the club and I was like, what am I getting into? But then Paul Salama came out of that, and that was really, you know, intriguing and fun. And so it was an all women's band, and the first incarnation was like 18 people. And we played percussion, and there was a bass player or two. And uh, it was kind of a, there were no guitars, so it was an original take on uh, entertainment. And uh, it really went a long way. It made a big impression on me. I had a lot of fun doing it. And we would have themes, so we'd dress like Greek goddesses, or you know, we'd have our own version of like the the, the new wave romantic look. <laughs> but mm -hmm. I actually would find fabric in the trash. Like uh, I, I remember a liquor store was throwing out their displays, and there was like lame fabrics, and they weren't really garment fabrics, but I made some dress. And as I was dancing, the upholstery zipper in the back would like come undone. <laughs> So, I mean, we really had a lot of fun. And uh, Stacy Elkin was a, a great designer, and she custom made a lot of dresses for different people in the group, and, like with hand embroidery and, and sequins, and they were quite original. And uh, yeah, yeah, so Anne kind of helped springboard these ideas and make them happen. And uh, she invited me along to a few things. She did a photo shoot where she was a ballroom dancer at Roseland Ballroom. And, you know, I was just part of the crew. 
So it was kind of fun to see what she would come up, up with. She used to go to the um, Easter parade on Fifth Avenue. I never did that, but now I go all the time. <laughs> but, but I think she created a lot of her characters. I think Club 57 for her, I mean, aside from what she did in college, she created a lot of characters in Club It gave her the opportunity to create these different characters. And I think she still does a lot of them now, you know. Mm -hmm. Like collaborating with Joey Arias when they did uh, Gala and Salvador Dali. So, you know, there was lots of opportunities to showcase these characters. And we're still friends now, you know, we're still in regular contact. Mm -hmm. and you still see her when she comes in or in California. So and maybe she's watching remotely now. She said she would. So. But, um, but a lot of us have stayed friends. It's amazing yeah. after all these years, you know, to this day. We're still really good friends. So. What do you all think of Manhattan, New York today? What comes to your mind? Mm, I still love it. Um, yeah, you get the mic. But I still love it. But um, if I was the age when I came then, I would not come now. I just would not be able to afford it. I never made that kind of money or had that kind of lifestyle. So it's really changed because somebody like me would not be able to come and move here. It wouldn't happen. I don't know where I would go, but it wouldn't probably be here. Just couldn't afford it. So. Anybody can say. <clears throat> Don't squeeze the camera. Hmm? <laughs> so, what do you think about Manhattan? New York today, Manhattan, right? City, Manhattan. Manhattan. Now, yeah. I live here 50 years and I really love Manhattan. I know any stone on the street, I know every building. And I, I also was guide for many people who were coming from Poland, from my family and for friends to show you, to show Manhattan for many people, okay? So it has changed so much. How, how do you experience Manhattan the city is, now? What do you think of it? It's, it's really for me, it's so different. It was so punky before. <laughs> many of them, now you don't see punks anymore. You know, they get dressed, <laughs> they have a spastic card. <laughs> they have a, even in uh, Hammer and, and uh, Hammer and Sword, whatever. And, and they have even, <laughs> they, they have forget. even the band, the communists. <laughs> they have nothing to do with the, the communists, but they put the name, very aggressive and sneaky name, okay? The niggers, the you know, communists, they, they opened the club. Yeah, it was subversive. It was against the system. Yeah. It and was everybody, not. Everybody was like friends. There were so many bands playing in the basements. They even now go every park. Yesterday I was in the, in the, in the park, some Pink Square Park, and the guy was playing for nobody. So I, I went over there, I gave them some money. He was, he was just a music, country music, he was singing. Everybody wants to play somewhere, and we're in too, too many places, except like say, CBG and Martin's concert. So that's why they, were, they wanted to play for nothing, because they have the love for music and for the friendship, okay, what well, they do what they discovered between themselves. And they like to be stylish, <laughs> punk stuff. <laughs> so sometimes they would tie and, and black jackets, sometimes mm, ripping pants and, you know, and earrings, necklaces, I'm talking about the boys. So, and now it's really changed. His village was like strange place. From Avenue A, I never go over there. Everybody was afraid to go behind the A Avenue A. Mm. And now it's just, everybody wants to be over there. Apartment, apartment now is so high price that's higher than uptown. 
in this village. Okay. Everybody wants to be there. People who come in here as tourists from another country, they come into the East Village. So that's why you can see on the streets <laughs> many, many sites taken by restaurants because so many people come in here, not in other places. Yeah, and so, and Manhattan belongs part, partially to Keith Herring <coughs> because three, his sculpture we have downtown and one sculpture is on the, on the San Marx place, yes, San Marx place, yeah. yes. Yeah, the after yes, place. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So we apply to, to uh, East Village Society to put Flat 57 away in San Marx below. Something like they put hundreds of names. I don't know who they are, those people. But they, the Susan came from Berlin, Susan, my wife, my, from my assistant. They went with there, they say, oh, very low class people. They say, you need 400 signatures from the people who live over there. There is not so many people over there. <laughs> and they just look sneaky way how to tell it, tell you no. So we didn't have Club 57 name. <laughs> well, it, it should be, and it, it is important. <laughs> So where do, you, where do you guys go now? Where do you go? Is there places where you go where you feel this is close to the spirit? Are there clubs? Are there venues? Or but where do you go now, all of you? Well, there were other places. That, OK, well, then the pyramid sort of came after Club 57. I mean, right now, at this um, time. Right now. Um, not no, listen, no, you know what? That is true. That is true. Because you know what? Clubs are not made for people who are over 60. And I don't want to go out at midnight and stay out till four drinking. But there are things that, you know, we, of course, we all have things that we like to do. We see often people that we know doing shows. We go right. to galleries. We, uh, you know, we go places and we do things. They're just not the same. And I think that if we did exactly the same things, we would be kind of like sad old alcoholics sitting on the same bench, you know, having your drinks, it's five in the morning, now what? I mean, th this is, clubs are not for people our age. They just are not. Yeah, I, I do some social dancing and like tonight there's a party at Bella Absent Park. I don't know if I'm gonna get there in time. It's over at nine, but um, I just See, did the, the dance party time. with my husband. <laughs> and it's like, that's a kind of event that I'll just show up and do your thing, and anybody could sign up with their crew to do the dance parade. So we just did it, but only because we couldn't do something else the same day. I said, oh, let's do this instead. So our friends who do Lindy Hop had a group, and we just jumped in. And they'll also do the uh, Mermaid Parade. The Mermaid Parade's another example. Danny's band also plays there. Uh, as Danny has a samba reggae marching band, right. Bogo yeah. Azul, if you haven't seen it. So there are things that it's not a nightclub setting, but you could still have your own creative energy. And, you know, you put some rehearsals into it and you give it your best. And, you know, maybe people take a picture and you'll see it in the paper. Right. And our friends, our friends um, from Jackie 60, which was another club that I start, we started going to after, and we're still friends with that crowd too. And um, they just did a night of a thousand Stevies, which they do once a year. And we would go to that and run into friends and people that we know. So. There's things happening. It's just not, we don't go out every night. There's no calendar for us for every night <laughs> like there was. So that's, that's one of the yeah, big You things. know, Dance Parade and Dance Fest in uh, Tompkins Square Park. And that's a really fun event. That's great. Yeah, and, um, outrageously fun. you know, it's fun to go in and hear the house music and stuff. And then it's over at 7. Right. And then, and then <laughs> yeah. And Suzanne Barsh <laughs> is having a book signing tonight at uh, the yeah, Marcus. So right, um, so like the pyramid party that that we that they just did for the book. Yeah, we got to see a bunch of old friends. So we're not even cut off so much. It's just that our interests have changed too. 
Yeah, we, like if Joey Avarius is performing, I'll probably go to Joe's right. pub. And you know, I, we keep up and then we'll see a few friends in the audience. And right. you don't have to contact anybody, you just show up and you just know instinctively. But it's, yeah, it's not the same scene as when I was in my 20s. I'm not that right. interested but that's in okay. doing that again. But I mean, Ann Magnuson did that Club 57 thing in LA and Damien and I got to go for that. So it's just more random. It's not that we're cut off so much, but we're so random about it. But uh, how wonderful that these light is still. Like uh, Thomas Mann, the German writer, said why he likes the light from stars that travel to the universe arrive still at the Earth. The star isn't there, but uh -huh. the light uh, still shines. It's there, and you can see it, you can feel it. You, and I think this is also true um, for your great club, and I really wish so much I would have been there and I had a story to tell, mm -hmm. uh, which I don't, but um, you know, they, they have a certain lifetime, and they belong to the people of the time and who have the right and um, who experienced it. So really thank you uh, for joining us. I hope yeah. you might stay for seven o'clock for the pyramid, okay, but I would like to ask you all to give really um, a hand to the life's work and love of Stanley and all of you. So we are taking a little break and we will be back at seven o'clock. Thank you. I turned my mic off. I think so. And the, the, love, the love of Club 57 came in everywhere. Oh. Madonna kissing him. Oh, amazing. I can't believe it. It's so awesome. Yeah. Incredible. You talk? No. That's some, that's from some newspaper. I thought it just, I you how lost of that seven spread. Yeah.